because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. I'm excited for you to listen to this podcast with Eric Musselman, but just before we do, I wanted to let you know I just released a new blog on Dave Smart's Carlton Basketball Competitive Shooting Charts, and it can be found at basketballimmersion.com. And the event coming up that you need to know about is our third BI Academy for Coaches, which is taking place September 7th at Cal State Fullerton. Big shout out and thank you to them for hosting in the Los Angeles area. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash clinics for more info, clinic testimonials, and a video showing what happened at our last Coaching Development Academy. Lastly, please take a moment and give us a five-star review wherever you listen and or a shout out on social media as every little part helps us grow and sustain this podcast. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Today, I'm really excited to have Eric Musselman with me, current head coach at the University of Arkansas and previously had tremendous success at Nevada. And uh, as as many of you know, his background is tremendous in basketball and uh, NBA head coach and uh, collegiate head coach and just so much experience. Coach, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on, Chris. Coach, I got to say, in a way, you're an inspiration for what I'm doing right now. And that is because you are probably the original coach that shared openly. And you did that through, and, and a lot of listeners may not even know, it's still up. It's still a tremendous resource. The Eric Musselman Basketball Notebook, which you started in 2007. And I believe you ran it for about three years, Coach, but there's so much great information on there. And I, I do think that you were one of the original sharers and uh, just a tremendous influence on me and other coaches. So do you want to talk quickly about how that came about? Yeah, so what originally what happened, Chris, is I, I read every day about an hour and 10 minutes every day on an elliptical machine or a stair stepper or a treadmill. And what I was doing was I, I highlight stuff when I read it, things that I think are things that I want to save as a coach or things that I want to talk about with our team, things that I might want to keep in a file for down the road. I might read something that spurs an idea on a motivational pregame speech. So I, I ended up highlighting that stuff. And then I would go back and pull the article. And I, I first started emailing coaching friends. And it started off three or four guys. And it ended up being over a 1,000 coaches at, at all different levels that were a part of the email. And I decided, you know what, the email process became too cumbersome. Um, and so I started the blog where I would actually – uh, take parts of articles or thoughts or whatever uh, and turn them into short blogs to, to be able to share. And You know, the thing is, in the coaching profession, all of us are taking ideas from other people. And so I've learned so much from so many different walks of life that I want to try to share as well. And I think as you get older in your profession, you want to share even more. I think when you're younger, Sometimes you want to keep all your stuff and you don't want anybody to get any of your ideas. And as you grow in the profession, you become much more of a sharer. And you also learn as you get older, like, wow, I had a grad assistant today give me a great idea that spurred a thought process for our staff. And, you know, it's interesting, like right now I'm reading a lot of press conference articles on hockey coaches. I'm not even an NHL fan. But there's a lot of things that you can learn from reading articles on new hires. And so right now I'm reading all I can about all the NHL changes that are happening in the coaching profession. Well, it just shows you the diversity of learning experiences that is available to you if you look for them. And, and again, I think the genius of what you did back then is that you made a concise version of the article for all of us to first look at and then decide if we wanted to look deeper at. And I assume from that, you took the most relevant things that you thought. And again, just an incredible resource. And I encourage coaches to go back and look at that. And your updated, I guess, more improved technology version is coachmust.com, which is up as well, which are both things that coaches should look at. But uh, coach, we got so many places to go with you and grateful to have your experience here. But let's start with maybe, what about your experience in the NBA has helped you in college 
find so much success because clearly you have a tremendous background in the NBA and the professional game. And you seem to have transferred a lot of ideas, I would assume, to the collegiate level to help you be successful. Yeah, no question, Chris. I think, you know, like when I start thinking about my pro experience, it goes, you know, kind of a little bit beyond just the NBA. It's also the minor leagues. I got an opportunity to coach at a very, very young age. And when you're a head coach, you you know, you're kind of in that fire and you learn. Uh, At least I learned on the fly a lot and feel so fortunate to have done it at the minor league level where there's not a lot of media scrutiny. So I was kind of able to throw ideas, try different things without being under this microscope of criticism. And I think it really helped me grow as a coach, uh, much like if a guy was coaching maybe at the high school level or somebody was coaching at a division two level where, where there's not the media scrutiny. I think a lot of times those guys are, are the greatest coaches that we have because they coach with the purity. They're not coaching under what, if I make this substitution or I run this out of bounds play, I'm going to be criticized. And so the minor league experience really helped. But as, as I look at now being a college coach and the NBA experience, I start thinking about how do you put together a team? And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to use a model of, of the way that a general manager and his scouting department would look at recruiting and how you actually build a roster. And what we've done is we've talked about players and we kind of categorize in staff meetings, whether it's a transfer or a uh, high school player, is this guy going to be a lottery pick talent or is this player going to be a mid first round talent? Or is this guy going to be a second round talent or is this guy a non-draftable player? And I don't mean four years down the road or when they go to the pros. I mean, we put the guys in those buckets on how they would be for us at the collegiate level. And obviously, when you look at the NBA today, you know, in that lottery pick bucket, you're going to have to have like two of those guys at minimum to be a playoff team in the college. It might be to be in the top three or four in your conference. And then you're going to have to have you know, the stars, like, you know, every NBA team that's trying to win a championship has got to have three stars right now. That's kind of the formula. And at the college level, when we're in our recruiting meetings, we're talking about, hey, who are our three stars on today's roster? Or when we look into recruiting, you have a four-year plan. So we've tried to do all we can, Chris, to formulate that type of thinking rather than the current model, which most of the college profession uses, meaning a three-star, four-star, five-star. We've tried to kind of utilize it as a draft pick, or if a guy's a transfer, we start talking or use the terminology or the phrases that an NBA GM and his scouting staff would use with free agents. In other words, if a a guy, if a young man is transferring out we look at that player and we say, you know, is this a mid-level exception free agent? Is this just a free agent that you're going to get on a minimum type deal? Or is this player a star where he's a max out guy? And so we try to utilize that. And then we're able to look at organizations in the NBA like the Philadelphia 76ers, see how they built their model through what they call the process, or you look at how, what the Warriors have done, where they've added a star free agent in the Durant like, but yet they've also got the draft picks, which we would equate to incoming freshmen. They built with guys like Clay Thompson and Draymond Green and Steph Curry, and then they've added some of their bench players as well through the draft. So Uh, guys like Looney. So that's kind of how we've tried to look at, Chris, how to build our program. Well, it's it's really neat and it's great phrasing. And I'm I'm curious, is this internal dialogue or do you share some parts of that with recruits in terms of how you phrase it to them about how you're approaching it? Is that something that uh, ties into recruiting too? We actually do. I mean, every day, like we've had a meeting uh, in the morning and we usually have one before we leave, just kind of think tank things because we're constantly changing 
for instance, uh, one of our assistant coaches, Clay Mosier, uh, has worked at, with me. Uh, this is the sixth spot. And so he's been here like two weeks and he's amazed at how much we've evolved and changed because Clay and I haven't worked together for the last five years or so. So with us, it's every day. How do we improve? How do we get better? But to answer your question, you know, we do have a pro model, we call it. So with our pro model, it's so all encompassing. Yes, we do talk about our model because I think it's really important with recruits that you lay out the foundation of what their role would be in year one and then how you see that role potentially evolving with a player's player development plan. So there's no question that I think you have to lay out your model with a player. You've got to explain your internal thought process as a staff when you look at the whole team, but then also each individual corporation, meaning each individual player, what his inner circle is going to want to know, what the vision is in the immediate plan and then in the future plan. And and that inner circle is obviously a mom, a dad, the player, a high school coach, AAU coach, all those branches that touch a particular player, you're going to probably have to sell a clear-cut vision on how you see a certain player's role. And, you know, sometimes programs can can oversell a player's role. And what I have found uh, happens then is then you have internal turmoil in the locker room. So you're much, much better uh, to sell the clear, honest vision on the front end because you can't win at any level, whether it's third grade CYO or or high school, you've got to have great team chemistry and people have to understand that on a team, a basketball team, a football team, a baseball team, players have to understand their roles. You don't have to agree with the role that a coaching staff lays out for you, but you have to buy into that role or it's never going to work. You mentioned the word tinkering and I'm going to circle back to that, but one of the other things that you kind of mentioned is this transfer concept which you've had tremendous success with transfers. And again, in this day and age, that seems to be something that you should be good at as a collegiate head coach because there's just a plethora of transfers. But has, has your background made it a little bit easier to relate to transfers in the sense that, as you said, you dealt with the minor league players, you've dealt with obviously transitioning from jobs, you know, different things like that. that do you feel like you're able to relate better to transfers because of your background? I don't think there's any doubt you know, relating to guys, you know, so let's say you get a grad transfer because I've gotten a lot of phone calls, Chris, from really, really successful division one, long time head coaches, guys that I've had incredible admiration for from afar, guys that are role models to me or people that I really, really look up to asking for advice on for instance, the topic of a grad transfer and how do you, I think some of the concern with the, with a college coach, whether it's football or, or basketball, is how do you get that player involved into your culture? Because I think so, there's a lot of guys that have coached long time in college basketball, Chris, that have used the model of, you know, freshman year, you're kind of learning, sophomore year. Uh, now you're starting to understand the culture. And then the third and fourth year, they're executing the culture. And then by their senior year, they're actually teaching the new incoming freshmen that culture. And that that's the environment that I grew up in. My four years at the University of San Diego, nobody transferred but one kid. And in my era, or the guys that are around my age, the people that are 50 to say 60 years old, there'd probably only be two or three transfers in a conference per year, or maybe only 10 guys in in the conference that I played in throughout the four years that I played. That's obviously completely changed now. And so I think, you know, the concept of can you get a player integrated in your program in a very short time, if your background is such that, you know, like, you take a guy like Flip Saunders or, or Phil Jackson or George Carl, these guys that coached in the minor leagues, Dave Yeager, these guys are used to, you get a player, 
that player might be with you for two weeks. It might be your best score. And then that player gets called up. And then another player comes and the guy that you might replace that great score with might be a rebounder because, you know, in mid-year, it's hard to replace a score for a score. And so you've got to really be able to adapt your style of play. You've got to be able to fit pieces into a puzzle as quick as possible. And so when you get a grad transfer and you have him all summer and you have him in September and October, and then you don't play until November, to me, that's a lot of time. It's a lot different than when the Golden State Warriors sent you Jeremy Lin and say, hey, he's going to be with you for two weeks. He needs to play 30 plus minutes a night, and then we're going to pull him back up. And when you're used to to an environment of great players being shuffled back and forth, I think you're, you can adapt and relate to that player, meaning a transfer, whether it's a grad transfer, it could be a sit one, play three, a sit one, play two, a sit one, play one. I do think that your mentality completely changes if you're from a pro environment and then especially if you're from a minor league environment. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating times, and certainly you have to be adaptable as a head coach. And uh, clearly, again, you're demonstrating that with your success with transfers and everything else. So, Coach, another uh, question. So your approach between Season 3 at Nevada after going to the Sweet 16 and heading into Season 4, where you were the hunted, so to speak, what's the difference in that type of approach? The one you prove yourself, and then the next one you're expected to stay or be better. What type of things change in between those years in terms of your approach? Well, there's, there's so much that changes, um, not just in, you know, not just in, in, in the coaching staff's approach, because really Chris in, in year one, for instance, at Nevada, you know, they were coming off seven division one wins and, and we were able to finish in fourth place in the mountain West and kept getting better as the year progressed, got hot towards the end of the year ended up winning the CBI championship. And then we go into year two and still there wasn't a lot of expectations. And we make an NCAA tournament. We win the Mountain West. And then going into year three, I felt like, you know, we were, you know, high expectations that year. And we were able to really handle the expectations because we ended up going to a sweet 16. But at that point, things really started to change. So even though we were coming off a Mountain West championship in year two, going into year three, high expectations because the talent level was phenomenal going into year three, we were able to handle everything. And then we surpassed where people thought. I think people felt like, you know, we could be a team that could win the Mountain West. We could be a team that could win a game possibly in the NCAA tournament. And obviously, being a basket away from advancing to an Elite Eight that year, we did surpass everything. And the hoopla in the summer with the fan base, with the national media, because we had so many returning players, although they were involved in testing the NBA waters. And I think right at that point, Chris, things start to get a lot more, you got to have a lot more energy, effort conversations communications when a player goes to test the waters because now that player his inner circle they're starting to think about time beyond college and a lot of guys are thinking that but when you actually are starting to go to nba workouts you're in the nba facilities you're talking to nba head coaches you're talking to nba general managers all of a sudden now your thought process is geared towards that meaning between our third and fourth summers, now guys are starting to think about that. And then we had three players test the waters and all come back. We add a grad transfer that's a talented player in a hole that we were really small. So we filled the need getting a a taller, bigger, more athletic center who could play against power five centers. And so now your dynamics of your group slightly changes. And then you have all these expectations and I've never been a part of a team that played with such expectations, meaning preseason top 10 team, but yet you're still at a mid-major school and program. And so you have the expectations internally that you put on your group. The players have their own expectations of how far they want the 
you know, the season to go. And, and, and obviously when you make a sweet 16, you want to try to reach for the next goal and to continue uh, to grow and, and think instead of worrying about the game in front of us and the 40 minute battle that you have that night, we started looking beyond that. And we started off like 11 and 0. we were ranked the entire season in the top 20. Um, and for 85, 90% of the season, we were ranked in the top 10 and we were doing great. And I thought, Chris, we were right on pace to exactly where we needed to get to. Uh, and then we, when we finally lost a game, we were fine then, but we stopped enjoying winning. Um, the first three years in Nevada, every time we won, we celebrated behind closed doors in our locker room. And I would come home after a game and we would win by 12 points. And my wife would sense frustration. And I think that that was unfair to college student athletes because it should be the best four years of their life. And at the end of the day, they are still students trying to figure out the real world. And so I do think that between season three and season four, there's a great learning lesson for me as a 54 year old coach who's coached at every level all over the world. I learned when there's those high expectations, that might be a time where you've got to do a lot more fun team building type things, not to build your team up, but actually to take their mind off the game. And I'm, I'm glad that I experienced that last year. Hopefully it'll help me in the future as well. So that's good. I mean, so you would have had more focus on celebrating those small moments that were really big moments in previous years, but they still meant something that year. And then the other thing, obviously, as you're talking about is the attentional focus got broader for your players, but somehow you've got to keep them internally focused on obviously the task at hand and all those different things. So those challenges, and again, the other part of this is that you seem to be from the outside looking in and the different things I've read, like a culture that's built on energy. That's another part of this. Was, was this energy that's so much a part of success in a program, was that directed in different places and you had to keep bringing it back to the team? Since, as you said, these players had these different focuses on the NBA, on you know, their pro careers, and then obviously all the external people telling them how great they are. Because of the character of our guys at Nevada, Cody Martin is, is one of the greatest teammates that I've ever coached. Maybe one of the greatest leaders that I've ever been around. I've been around a lot of NBA guys and, and, and Caleb Martin is a incredible competitor who hates to lose. And Jordan Caroline, without a doubt, is the hardest playing guy that I've ever been around. So you got three guys that were really big time competitors, hated to lose. I never thought that they lost any of their energy or focus towards who we were or what we were trying to accomplish. I kind of felt more, Chris, that it was the external pressure of all of us, the coaching staff, the players, not understanding that we had 30 opportunities to go compete and we needed to have fun and enjoy just the thought of competing and trying to beat somebody in that other tunnel or that other locker room, just trying to win that game on that night. And then when you do win, use that as a time to, to, to enjoy, have fun. And then if you lose, use that as an opportunity to try to get better. And I think when the expectations because it just doesn't happen at a mid-major very often. Obviously, what Mark Few and Gonzaga has done is, is, is insane, how year after year they're a ranked team. And, uh, but but, but uh, at most mid-majors, when you get ranked at all during the course of the college season, it's a great accomplishment to be ranked in the top 10. Just just doesn't happen often. And I thought that expectations in our own city – with our fan base, I just thought that those expectations were not one of, hey, this is really fun season. This is a great team. Because I believe 25 years down the road, the perception is going to be that that is one of the greatest sports teams that's ever been on that campus. And so, but I do think that the expectations 
you've got to know how to manage those. Um, and that's why guys like Coach K and Coach Izzo, guys that have been doing it year after year, they're so great at it. People don't understand. When you have a really, really talented team, those are usually the teams that are the most difficult to coach. Uh, it's easy to coach a team that's an underachieving team, a, a team that has overachievers, a team that is built on work ethic, a team that's not expected to do well. Those are the easiest teams to coach. And what Phil Jackson did with all the talented rosters that he's coached, and people always say, well, he won because he had talent. Well, you know what? Those talented players are often the most difficult to try to coach as well. Yeah, no, there's there's no question that's a big part of this this process in terms of uh, coaching and getting players aligned and everything like that. So, Coach, maybe let's shift gears a little bit. I want to ask you a little bit of offensive question. And again, this is from the outsider, so I'm not sure how accurate this is. But when I watched your teams play, it seemed to me that you weigh very, very much on getting the ball in the right player's hands in the right area of the floor. And it doesn't seem like what you did was overly complicated, but what you did was really effective and it showed in your efficiencies because you seem to have the right players in the right place. Is that the conscious process for what you're trying to do with the different offensive sets or the different things that you do? You seem to be very much matchup oriented on offense. I don't think there's any doubt, Chris, from an offensive philosophy. It's, you know, in the NBA, if you don't have your best players taking the highest volume of shots, in their sweet spots, you're not going to win. You know, in other words, people watch Houston play and they wonder why Harden's taking so many. Well, he's taking so many shots because a bad James Harden shot is better than your seventh or eighth man taking the shot. When I watch college basketball, we all as coaches would love to see the ball go from first side to second side to third side, multiple people touching the ball, bodies moving, split screens. I mean, we all want that. but when I first got into college basketball as an assistant coach, which was, which was the best thing that I ever did was three years as an assistant coach to try to learn the college game because it is different. One of the things that I kept watching is at the end of shot clocks, why is the worst offensive player taking a shot? And it, when I studied it, it was like, well, a lot of college coaches want to see ball movement. They, want, uh, they don't want to take a, the first available quick shot. They like to milk the clock a little bit more. And so we've tried to bring a pro model from an offensive standpoint, meaning, hey, we want to try to beat the defense up the floor. We want to push it, but we don't want to be in a hurry. We want to play with good pace. And one of the philosophies that that we use, Chris, is a soccer term or a hockey term. You've got to get a shot on goal. And our teams do take some bad shots. There's no doubt about it. Like Tom Thibodeau is a very good friend of mine. He'll watch our teams play and call and say, you, have you lost your mind with your shot selection? <laughs> but I felt like the worst thing in college basketball is a live ball turnover because a live ball turnover ends up usually in a layup or a foul at the other end or an and one at the other end. And your defense doesn't have a chance to get set. The other team is scoring with numbers. So our team is built on do not turn the ball over. And for four years, we've been one of the lowest turnover teams on a very high assisted turnover ratio for a team that plays fairly fast or plays with a pretty good pace. We're a really, really low turnover team. And that's because of that philosophy of we want the right players taking the right shots in their sweet spots, and we always want to get a shot on goal with no live ball turnovers. Hey, Coach, just a quick interruption from the podcast. I just wanted to let you know I would love for you to join BasketballMersion.com, of course, to help support all the online sharing I do. But I don't want to interrupt these podcasts for ads anymore. From now on, ads for Basketball Immersion events and products will be at the end of the podcast. I hope you will check them out. For instance, this week I'm sharing information about our BI Training Academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th. Go to www.basketballimmersion.com, BI Training, to learn more or listen at the end of this podcast for more information. Now let's get back to the podcast. 
So how are you communicating that to the other players? Like, how are you defining roles then within that? Because again, this is very much again a pro model, which I agree with. And, you know, I think too many teams don't sometimes get right to the point, which is get your best player in a situation where they can score or draw help. So you're doing that. But part of that is now defining the roles of your other players, the Danny Greens and the different players like that off the ball. So what are some of the things practically that you're doing to define those roles? Well, I always tell the players, I don't define the roles. You define the roles in the off season. So, you know, for instance, uh, who's going to be our three point shooters at Arkansas? Well, who's putting in the time this off season, become a better shooter. And then if guys are returning, what is your three point percentage in game action? And I do think Chris, that roles evolve during the course of the season. So right now, like, they're defining their own roles. So we're only allowed to practice four hours a week right now. We're sitting here watching. All right. So no live ball turnovers is a big philosophy. Who's turning the ball over? Well, if a guy's turning the ball over a lot in practice, he's probably going to not get a lot of minutes at Arkansas based on who we are. But we'll, what we'll end up doing is we'll end up telling guys um, in November before our first game, probably 48 hours before our first game because we don't want to deflate anybody what their own expectations are. But we'll say, hey, in late game, if this game gets down to the last shot, here's the order of who we want taking the shot. And we'll go one through 13 and just let them know. Now, obviously, if a player uh, gets double teamed or the defense does a good job of denying your first option, that's fine. We'll tell our team, like, then it goes to option two and so on and so forth. But guys are in their role based on somewhat what they've done in the past. And then more importantly, what you've done in the off season to set yourself apart. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great point to be able to, uh, to establish that for your players and, and again, put, give them the opportunity to be able to compete. So, which is, again, part of your philosophy, it seems to be this competitive philosophy. So coach, uh, again, this is a compliment, but you seem to run simple plays, but you seem to run a lot of them. Do you put in new plays each game to exploit certain matchups? You mentioned tinkering. So we're kind of going back to that. And then if so, how do you help your players retain the set so well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Chris. So we do have a, you know, probably as big as play package as, as anyone in college basketball. My mentors, guys like my father, Mike Fratello, you know, Chuck Daly, those guys had really big playbooks. Chuck Daly was probably the most simplistic uh, coach that I've been around, but, but we had a lot of variations on plays that we ran. And, and the one thing that I always felt was really, really important. And my dad was really, really good at it. We've tried to, as a staff, continue to evolve in this area is if you're going to have a play call, you need that play call to make sense to the player. And if you're going to have a lot of variations of plays, like there's got to be a rhyme or reason for the set. So in other words, if for us, one of our base sets is called a 50 set. Well, every part of our 50 set, they line up in the same alignment to start the play. So we have 50 up, 50 down, 50 red, 50 fist, 50 fist red. All those plays start out in the exact same alignment. And the first two or three movements out of each of those is the exact same. Then you get into the second part of the play call number, which all has a rhyme or reason for what we're doing. So whether when I was a player or whether I've been an assistant coach, if you're working for somebody or playing for someone and someone calls one play three, and there's no reason for what that three means. And then you have another play called four. And then four months later, you don't like your three play call and you throw that out and put another three in it's a whole different play. It confuses everybody. And the worst thing is, uh, and coaches don't want to admit it, if your assistant coaches don't know, know all your plays, how are your players going to know it? And to be honest with you, Chris, I've worked in the NBA. I've worked in college. 
and had assistant coaches not know your own playbook. And so you've got to figure out how can everybody, the, the grad assistants, you want it so simple even that your trainer, when he hears a play call, he knows what's coming. And so I, I do think that you've got to simplify the game as much as possible. And a lot of that has to do with how is the player remembering a play? And, and then I also think that, you know, for us, we kind of have a philosophy like the Patriots, like we're going to change game to game on who we are. We want to keep the, the basic identity of who we are, but we have new themes each game. So we will maybe start a game off with a new play. Uh, maybe we'll hold a new play until the last five minutes of the game on a, on a certain matchup that we think can help us. But I don't think, you know, without a doubt, you see, there's all these different ways to coach and, and you've got to decide who you want to be and what you want your team to be. And, and, and there's a lot of great coaches that I've been around that, that they, it doesn't matter who they play. They have their own system. In practice, they only work on who they are. They don't worry about who they play against. And so some of the greatest coaches of all time have done that. For us, we're kind of the exact opposite. Like if we're getting ready for a certain team, I want to know that opponent's strengths and weaknesses. We want to take advantage of their defensive weaknesses. We want to try to take away their strengths offensively with our defense. And so that's part of evolving as a coach. Like who do you want to be? What do you want your base philosophy to be? And I think it really is determined by, you know, what is the coaching staff's personality as well I think that goes hand in hand with with what is your overall philosophy because uh, you've got to really be strong with any message that you come forth with your team. You can't so, be guessing on your philosophy of what you want to do. And one of the great lessons as a young coach that I got was was Coach Chuck Daly. He said, "Don't ever put in a play unless you know it works." Um, and that stuck with me, you know, all these years is. He, he was basically saying, don't experiment in front of your team. Do that behind closed doors with your staff. Oh, interesting. Uh, that's great. Coach, so uh, the, the naming system is obviously a part of uh, your players remembering the plays and executing the plays. And say you have 100 plays or 50 plays, whatever it is, they don't need to know all 50 for that game as much as you're emphasizing a certain percentage of them specific to the opponent. Is that kind of what we're – we're saying there's no doubt Chris so so for us and when I wasn't coaching when I was let go by the Sacramento Kings what I did is I flew around I watched a lot of NFL practices watched a lot of college football practices and came up with some some new ideas and some new thoughts I actually had an office at the Oakland Raiders facility Michael Lombardi called me out of the blue uh, who was with the Raiders and he said hey come on you can you can utilize a desk we got a chair for you, a desk and a computer. You can watch basketball tape. You can get out of the house. It'll give you somewhere to come as if you're still working. And I took him up on that. And it was one of the greatest learning experiences I've ever had because I went down and watched football practice with him. And we talked philosophy. And so what we do, we actually have an offensive script where we'll script out the first 20 plays that we're going to run. Now, obviously, there's plays in transition that happen in the game. You know, you might have a passing game attack that you that's more of a five man continuity thing. But actual the play sets, uh, we'll try to script out our first twenty. We'll run them all week, and those twenty, it might be a wing pick and roll. So you see how the defense is playing your wing pick and roll. It might be a middle pick and roll, and you're kind of seeing are they going to weak it or. Are they icing it or how are they playing? Are they going to hard show, trap it? Um, and then you kind of put those in your memory bank on how an opposition is, is playing you. And then when you get into a late game situation, you can come back to something because you know how they're playing a down screen. Are they trailing it? Are they shooting the gap? And so we try to put together a package that allows us as a staff to try to get a feel for how the defense or what their game plan is against us. And we want to try to get as many of them as we can prior to halftime so that when we meet as a group at halftime, we are able to tell our team, hey, this is how they're playing the post. 
this is how they're playing the pick and roll. And then on the flip side, we also have watched enough tape where we know what their adjustments could be uh, because teams will make adjustments at halftime and we'll say, hey, we've already seen their plan A and they only have one other plan that they do all year. And so here's what could we could see in the second half. So that's kind of some of our philosophical things that we want to try to do from a scripting standpoint of the offense. Uh, it's it's good stuff. And uh, again, I, I had someone tell me this, that, that you have an assistant coach that's responsible for some play calling. Is that still happening or how does that work? It's interesting because when I was coaching in the NBA and you're playing 82 games, I, I called all the plays. You know, when we, when we go into a huddle, we don't meet as a staff. We, we, I go right into the huddle and, and, and then when I'm done with whatever I have to talk to the team, assistant coaches come with whatever they have. So we don't, I don't want to take up uh, 25 or 30 seconds of my time out to meet as a staff and then go in there. I like to go in, get my point in. I like to get feedback from the players right away. And then assistants can come in. But to answer your question about play calls, once I got to college, I think there's a lot more explaining that you have to do as a head coach to a player, whether he, when it's prior to going into a game, when he's subbed in, subbed out. And then, so I have allowed assistant coaches to make play calls based on he and I meeting during the course of the week and kind of laying out the script. And, and uh, I do think it allows you to coach both sides of the ball, you know, when you're not, you know, calling every offensive play. It's kind of a little bit more of a, of a football type model uh, to have one guy focused on defense, one guy focused on offense, and then the head coach overseeing both of your coordinators. Well, it seems to make sense based on what you said earlier too, which is what, that you want your coaches to know your plays clearly makes sense, but there's a reward for that too. And that's the fact that they get more empowered as well. They get more involved in the process. And, you know, another hard part about the collegiate system is as an assistant coach, it seems like it's really hard to get any type of coaching experience because again, you're not allowed to coach beyond being an assistant, you're a recruiter a lot of times. So I would think this is very empowering to your staff. Yeah, I mean, I think that with, you know, number one, you know, the great thing about being an assistant and being a head coach, and, and it's really great when you bounce back and forth and you're a head coach, then you're an assistant coach, and you're head, you, you kind of get in your mind, like, as an assistant coach, if I'm not involved in practice or a game, I'm just speaking honest, Chris, I'm bored. Like, I want to be involved. I want to coach. I want to have a drill if I'm an assistant coach. And so all the things that I disliked as an assistant coach, we've tried to implement when we have had a head coaching job. So in other words, I don't want my assistant coaches in practice standing on the sideline with their arms folded. I want them in the trenches coaching every second of every practice. And then as flip side, same thing in a game. I want my assistant coaches uh, during the game, uh, if, if they have a thought process on a play call, for those three guys while I'm standing up, maybe talking about the defense with our guy, for them to say, hey, let's run these three plays, our next three, and to allow them the flexibility to call those plays. Now, obviously, if, if I want to change them, you know, we'll, 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 we'll stop that philosophy. Um, but that's, I, I do think that, especially in college, like the, the pro coaches are growing on a daily basis because you're 82 games. But, but in college right now, we have a real issue with developing our younger coaches. Like it's, it's, a, it's a point of concern that we have younger coaches coming up in the business that know how to coach. Uh, because when I was growing up, it was how many clinics are you going to? You know, how many coaches retreats are you going to? A lot of that stuff has kind of fallen by the wayside. And luckily, due to people like you that are having these podcasts that people can work out uh, for 45 minutes and listen to your podcast and learn, that's a form of what the old school coaching clinics were. But still, when you're able to interact with a coach at a clinic and he's, and you can ask questions, it kind of changes your growth as a coach. And and right now, I think that, that, that we do need to continue to work with our younger coaches uh, for them to improve. And certainly, if you're 
a head coach and your coaches under your branch are improving as well. No, it's it's great. It's great to embrace that mentorship model that uh, that you're following, and uh, I'm sure your staff is grateful for that. So, coach. Uh, so, getting back to this, uh, the all these plays. Sometimes coaches wonder then, how are you practicing? How are you practicing with all these plays? Do you first introduce it five on zero? Do you first walk through it? What are you doing to implement these plays as you go into a week preparing for a specific opponent? Yeah, so let's say, you know, when we're in October getting ready for the season, what we'll do is we can we can show our guys the play. It'll be on their chairs when they walk in. We might text it to them the night before we put it in. They might see a video clip uh, when we're in November or December and we're adding a play. They might see a video clip of a prior team that we've coached running that particular play. Because everybody learns differently. Some guys need it on paper. Some guys need it on video. Some guys need to see it on the floor. And then skeleton, when you, when you skeleton or dry run your offense, we'll at times go five on O. Oh. We'll do, if we're adding a play that particular day, we'll do shooting stations where we'll break the five-man offense into four different stations so they see where all the shots are coming from meaning option one, option two, option three, option, and it might just be three on three on O at those stations. Um, and so I think there's a lot of different ways that, that you can, that you can teach your guys the offense. And, and we try to use all of those tools rather than, Hey, five on O because the days of going five on O for 30 minutes, um, they're just gone. I mean, you know, my son just finished his high school senior year and he absolutely dreaded the dry run skeleton part of practice. He freaking hated it. And you're talking about a coach's son uh, and somebody who wants to get into coaching. And so sometimes, Chris, will go five on oh and put music on um, so that those guys don't get overly bored and, and, they're, and they, can, they can have fun with it. So uh, sometimes we'll put crowd noise on when we're doing it, but I don't think you can walk in in today's world and think that you're going to skeleton dry run offense five on oh, 30 minutes for five days a week. It's you're, you're, you're not going to get execution because you're not going to get focus. And without focus, um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to execute. And so uh, we try to change it up as much as we can throughout the week when we're going through our different offensive sets and concepts. No, it's great insight. And I couldn't agree more that uh, obviously the five on O part, uh, you know, and it's basically proven to not lead to much transfer after initial learning either. So uh, it just doesn't engage your players in terms of their mental effort. So it's, it's great to have those insights in the here. And certainly that other part about giving them the video to their phone or the play to their phone or to on their chair, all that stuff's great. So I, I'm, you know, I think that's something that all coaches can apply. Coach, can you share something maybe that you've, uh, you know, learned this week from your readings, your daily readings, or, uh, you know, as you said, examining some hockey coaches? Uh, give us kind of a practical thing that you've learned, because I think it's remarkable, your commitment to your personal development. And again, I know it extends beyond coaching to, to you as a person as well. But uh, can you share a practical example of something you learned? What I read about this morning, actually, is you look at, you know, the St. Louis Blues who, you know, won the, the NHL. Their coach is an interim coach, and their head coach was fired a year ago. And so to me, that's really interesting. You're talking about a hockey team that mid-year, January, they were in last place and somehow figured out a way to win a Stanley Cup. And then you take a look at our NBA champions, uh, the Toronto Raptors and the fact that they made a coaching change, Dwayne Casey had coached him the prior year. And then this year it's Nick nurse. And as a coach, I'm wondering, you know, would have Toronto won that championship with coach Casey or how does management make a decision? Cause coach Casey was so successful or what was the thought process behind St. Louis Blues making their change with the coach, and then uh, how did you know a, f a first time organ within that organization coach both these guys 
win a championship, whether a coach was moved up from an assistant spot or whatever, it's still first first year uh, with those prospective clubs where they're actually winning a championship as a head coach. And I just think it's fascinating in the coaching world. Um, you know, there is a little bit of luck involved for sure um, in this business. And, and then, and then once you hit a certain spot as a coach, like a Phil Jackson or a Chuck Daly, I've always been fascinated with the automatic buy-in that those coaches get because of winning championships. And it could be at any level. Um, and so I, I think like a guy like Nick Nurse, his career is going to now change drastically because he has a championship ring and the credibility in the locker room changes uh, once you've proven yourself. And, and, and to me, it's just a fascinating thing to think that in two of our sports, winter sports that just ended, uh, that both those coaches were first time coaches within their prospective organizations. I'm curious if on a deeper level, it stimulates your thinking and other coaches thinking about the fact that as coaches, sometimes even if we're, we're there over, you know, a long time, four or five years, whatever, that we should consider changing a little bit, that we need to evolve and we can't be the same person because clearly, again, there's some deeper level thinking to this that just by changing the person, the team was able to excel. Now we know there's more factors to that you know, obviously adding Kawhi Leonard, different things like that. But on a deeper level, does it stimulate thinking like that? I don't think, I mean, when, you, <laughs> when you've worked with Coach Chuck Daly, he always felt that way, you know. And so I, I don't, you know, in college it's different, obviously, because, you're, you know, your players, you know, their cycle at most is five years, usually four, and now there's, you know, one and dones and the transfer stuff. So I don't, I don't necessarily think in that in the college game, but certainly at the professional level, coach Chuck Daly's big thing was he told us from day one as a staff, like, Hey guys, I don't want to coach that much in practice. I don't want them to hear my voice because we have all these mini meetings. Every single time we have a timeout is a meeting. And that's when the head coach is talking. And during the game, the coach is talking. And I remember coach Daly saying, can you imagine working in the business world? And during the course of the day, you had these two minute meetings every four minutes, like you do in an NBA game where there's a timeout, then there's a TV timeout and you got to go get together for two minutes and regroup and talk about what just happened. And his thing was like, think about that. If every four minutes, everybody left their desk, got up, huddled up, and you guys talked about what just happened and you had to continually do that throughout the day. And that, that was his, so his philosophy was, you know, the player's, over 82 games and a playoff, like they get tired of the same voice. Um, and that's why he allowed assistant coaches to do film. He, he allowed assistant coaches to do game preps. Uh, he, and, and you see that with Coach Popovich, where he allows a player to coach a game, or Steve Kerr, that same type philosophy, or Coach Popovich has an assistant coach coach a certain game. And so I certainly think at that professional level uh, that that thought process of empowering assistant coaches and giving your team a different voice becomes vital. Uh, just uh, tremendous stuff, coach. And again, I, I can't thank you enough for taking some time and providing us with all these insights into coaching and, you know, the coaching life. And uh, I encourage anyone who uh, isn't as familiar with the, the blog that you used to do to go back and check it out. And I think it provides real insights into who you are as a person as well. So I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time and sharing with us. No, this is great, Chris, and keep doing what, what you're doing. I wish we had one of your blogs every day, so every day I worked out, I could listen to, 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 to what you're sharing with the coaching fraternity. Appreciate you having me on. Well, thanks, Coach, and uh, I don't know if I'll get to the daily one, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll do a few more as we move forward, so <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for listening to the podcast, Coach. As always, I would love for you, if you're not already, to be a Basketball Immersion member. Go to basketballimmersion.com to learn more and uh, please join our growing community as we share the game of basketball, especially with a focus on small-sided games, coaching with a games approach to basketball, basketball decision training, and so much more. Videos, master classes that deep dive on subjects, 
and then a community of coaches that's there to support you and help you as you post your questions and you work in a collaborative way to be able to help each other stimulate your coaching. Also, upcoming dates for Basketball Immersion events, August 12th to 16th, BI Training, Palm Springs, basketballimmersion.com slash BI Training. This is where I can work with your players and help them develop so many of the concepts that lead to better basketball. And then September 7th, BI Academy, Los Angeles, basketballimmersion.com slash clinics. This is our coaching clinic for coaches to be able to immerse themselves in our topics. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.